All right, here we go. This is uh, yeah, Wild Outside Podcast Double Digits, something like 11 or 12. I'm not sure exactly. It doesn't matter at this point. So we are here at Odd Story. Uh, big thanks to them for giving us this awesome venue and free beer while we do this. Um, um, and it really kind of is a is an interesting podcast. It's not geared to one sport or one activity or anything. It's just cool people with odd stories, I guess, out in the woods uh, to talk about. we got some awesome guests um, here today. Before we get going on that, first a little bit about Wild Trails. Last week, I mean, Saturday, we did the first ever Little Owl Festival 5K. Um, I am an ultra runner, and we've always kind of, I don't know, we, we just have not been interested in these short distances ever. We always added a shorter distance to the ultras that we do, but it was like, we're going to add a half marathon to the marathon, or we're going to maybe add a 10K to the marathon that we have. But this is the only time we've ever done a 5K, and that's all we did. And it was awesome. It was really spectacular. Um, the Little Owl um, was a, is an is a old Indian tribe that lived out at Audubon Acres, and that's the way they got their name. But they have a festival every year, partnered up with the Happy Nest Foundation, which is a great organization that takes – songbirds and raptors and small mammals that get injured or get knocked out of their nest and they rehabilitate them and get them back into the wild and they had a uh, hawk that they released that day that had been in captivity for three months which is really long to heal a bird but it it got hit by a car and was almost dead a couple times but they brought it back to health and it took off and it was really really cool to see that so really neat organization there and we just had a great time and i will take this opportunity to announce that we are going to start a 5k classic out at audubon acres because i think it's probably one of the coolest 5k courses you'll find anywhere um, for high school athletes uh, the coach cannot teach cannot coach an athlete outside of their season so they we have for the runners we we have a summer to kind of get them onto the trails because most cross-country coaches don't want their runners being out on trails and it's ridiculous i mean if you're a cross-country coach out there and you're listening to this why are you doing that you're saying i don't want my runner to go on a trail because you're afraid of them twisting their ankle and getting injured but you're okay with guaranteeing that most of your athletes are going to get some kind of repetitive stress injury running on a track around the track the same direction all the time or on the road all the time with consistent repetitive stress stuff it just doesn't make sense look at signal mountain high school they have dominated cross country uh, ever since they started and it's not i mean it's part because they're you know they've got some really strong athletes that get in there but they run on trails everywhere they go it's all trails they don't have hardly any roads and so we're going to start that it's going to be in the summer i know it's going to piss off a bunch of cross country coaches but i don't care it's the right thing for the kids um, so brace yourself for that. It's going to happen. Um, this next week, we still have room. Chattanooga Trail uh, Relay out of, out of Enterprise South. Really cool thing. We've got uh, 18 teams signed up right now. We're looking for about five more. So if you want to be involved and you don't have a team, uh, come down to Fleet Feet. Um, I think Odd Story is going to be there for packet pickup. I'm not sure. We haven't talked about it. But anyway. Um, Fleet Feet on Thursday from 4 to 7. If you don't have a team, you want to be involved, we can kind of get you hooked up with a team. But it is a 24-hour, 96-mile thing. Um, there's three loops. There's a, basically a 7-mile, 5-mile, 3-mile. And uh, everybody on the team you know, has got to do all three loops together or spread out over 24 hours. doesn't matter. So that's about it for Wild Trails. Um, I didn't say that, I mean, we're here with L2 as well, L2 Outside, and partnered up with them as well. What, what do you got going on? Um, so our rental flow is all set up and ready for the summer. We had a uh, our grand opening this past Friday, thanks to all that story. We had some great beer there. We did free rentals all day long. Um, so come check out the rental flow, get out in the water with us this summer. We have season passes available now as well. Um, those run right at 350 for the whole season. You can go unlimited paddleboarding. So wow. come check us out. Buy a paddleboard for twenty five hundred dollars or three hundred bucks. Exactly. Use it all you want. You don't have to worry about storage. Yeah, and, and perfect repairs or anything. Three hundred dollars yeah. is almost like the cost of a repair. Yeah. So we got some awesome guests. Um, Dave Porfiri and uh, Ricky McAndrus are here. Let me just set the stage for why they're here. 
uh, we do this run every Thursday night out at the Tap House in St. Elmo, um, Trails to Ales. Um, and it's just, it's really kind of a personal thing for me. It forces me to get out there uh, every Thursday and run. If people want to join me, that's great. It's not. But, um, you know, in the, in the nice weather, it, you know, we can get, tw- we've had 20 or 25 people there. But um, I don't remember what, it was it was in the later fall, I think. It wasn't quite cold yet. I don't think we were we were cold. But anyway, joined up with these two guys. Never met them before, and just started chatting with this run. I think we did the was it the was it the big one? I think we went up to Mount Beautiful and around and down. I think it was miles. that's right. It was the it was the hard one. It was a seven mile. So it was the Mount Beautiful course, which is just a spectacular route. And you you both had done it before. No, I had. But you had. Okay, but you I had. had done it on my own. So you you've been here for six months. Well, no, I've been here. Oh, you've been here for two years. Eleven years. Yeah. So you've just been here for I'm six months. Month. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so we got to talking about Chattanooga. I don't know what brought it up, but why did you come to Chattanooga? It was kind of the, the conversation. Yeah. And both of these guys had awesome stories that um, need to be told, and then it kind of it's like. It's completely different stories, but leads to the same theme of what we're all about here. I mean, outdoors and, you know, why people would want to live here and how difficult it is living in a big city and such. So I was just kind of hoping that you guys could, I mean, we could do this podcast running and and just relive the (laughs) whole thing. Or you can just kind of remember what it is that you were talking about. Um, Just, I mean, Dave, if you wouldn't mind starting, just... um, Kind of do a do a reset and back up and what what sure. led you here? Um, well, you know, it was a bit of a push pull thing. Not crazy about the place I was living and wanting to you know, live in a place with those three magical words: quality of life. <laughs> right. I was getting to an age. I'm 50 now. I was getting to an age where in my uh, late 30s early 40s where i just really needed to uh just those you three were, words you were, were in california right LA. well i, I was in uh, los angeles several years prior to that i spent 10 years there and kind of considered that my prison sentence and uh, served my time <laughs> and uh, got out and then i went to washington dc where i served a, another sentence for five years i'm not sure and <laughs> which one's worse <laughs> They're both well, i went from the worst traffic in the country to like number two worst in the country uh, and i think there was a year there when i was living in dc where they actually got ranked above la as far as worst traffic ever so so, you know, I wasn't crazy about, um, you know, continuing to live uh, in that kind of world. I mean, to me, my, the day-to-day life is important, you know, but you're, if I you're, have to make sacrifices in other parts of my but life. But you're in the film industry and you're, you're, pa- you're, you're passionate about what you're doing. That's what drove yes, you in the city. Yes, yes. I, I've been a lifelong uh, film nut and just as a kid just wanted to be a filmmaker and that drove me to eventually move to Los Angeles. I went to grad school at USC film school and, uh, did the LA thing. Uh, but after 10 years, I got to the point where, you know, it, that, that dream of, uh, you know, directing movies in Hollywood was not as important to me anymore as just my day to day lifestyle. But I will say this about LA is that's where I first actually started trail running. And back then this was in the nineties. I didn't know I didn't know anyone else who did that. I thought it was some weirdo. I would go yeah. hiking, and then I thought to myself, I can run this faster than I can hike it. I'm just going to start running this. And so, I um, I don't know if uh, if trail running was an organized sport back then. Maybe it was, but I wasn't aware of it. But I was doing it. I was hiking a lot in the local trails, and there's a lot of them in Los Angeles. And then. Um, that was my attempt, even back then, to try to reconnect with the outdoors. In an, in an urban megalopolis, I was still not that far from Griffith Park, which is just riddled with trails. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you know, come to think of it, I mean, San Francisco and San Diego, yeah, they have solid trail community. I don't, I can't think of any significant race that ever happens in, in, in the area, or yeah, I just don't think there there's a trail community there that I'm aware of. Yeah, trail running community. There, there could very well be now. I haven't set foot in Los Angeles since I left in, yeah. in the year 2000. But anyway, fast forwarding, I went to D.C. 
uh, took a teaching position there at American University, and um, and there I kind of fell out of the the outdoor uh, lifestyle completely. I just there was wasn't was much there. of an opportunity. I was too landlocked, and then I, toward the end I did live in the country a bit, in Northern Virginia, but it, there weren't real established. Um, things I could do that were that close to where I lived as far as trails and, and running. I wasn't, I kind of fell out of running too during those years. Yeah. So what, what's the driving force that brought you here? Well, it was again, push pull looking to get out of the big city, but also looking for a quality of life that wasn't uh, too expensive, good place to live, good place to raise kids. Uh, and my wife and I, we kind of, whittled the list down quickly to about five cities in the southeast. We knew we wanted to be in the southeast because wow. my parents are in Florida. Her parents are actually here. She grew up in Chattanooga. So Chattanooga was immediately on the list, but it wasn't a given that we were going to move here. We really kind of played the field. We looked at Savannah. We looked at Winston-Salem. Those were two cities on our short list. We really actually liked Virginia uh, where we were living, but you know, maybe another part of Virginia, not not as close to the city. Yeah. And um, in a couple other cities we were looking at closely. And we like Savannah. It kind of came down to Savannah and Chattanooga. And we just basically, Chattanooga edged out all the other options. But, you know, this was right when the 21st century waterfront was coming online. And we just saw the leadership here in this city seem to be very forward thinking as far as promoting an outdoor lifestyle. So this was 11 years ago, and we just thought, wow, this city seems to be doing so everything right. So we only had right. half the aquarium then. Yeah, um, exactly. No river walk. Uh, you know, there wasn't, uh, seen the, you know, just, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, Renaissance Park wasn't there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. In the, I mean, north, yes. the North Shore yes. was kind of the I've big booming thing at that point. Come yeah. together since then. Oh, yeah. and, but, with the, right but, start. The, but the indicators were there. We were encouraged that this city is, was committed to moving in the right direction. So you moved here uh, with kind of a big question mark about how you're going to make a living, right? right? That's exactly right. I actually um, walked away from a, a tenure-track teaching position at American University, which yeah. many people would say that was really dumb, you know, but I... Just, I was not thrilled with um, being, you know, in that. Uh, I had a long commute every morning, yeah. traffic just unbearable. And, uh, you know, also there were particulars to that job. It was not the ideal job. So, sure. Um, but the the pull, again, the pull to this region was okay, the, the cost of living will be substantially less. So that helped offset the uncertainty about what are we going to do when we move here. Yeah. Uh, but what my uh, wife and I ultimately did, one of our plans was to to kind of put out our own shingle as a production company. We work in the film and television industry, and uh, and we did for for you know the last decade. I've done tons of TV commercials, uh, marketing videos for corporations, done a lot of travel shows, TV shows, documentary type shows for various TV networks. Sure. Yeah. So uh, it's been a good uh, home base to do all that. And just recently in the last two years, I've gotten back into full-time teaching at Macaulay yeah. where we started a media program there. Yeah. So, so uh, any, any regrets? Uh, to move into Chattanooga? No. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'll have a bad day and ask myself, you know, uh, was this the right decision? And I oh, quickly, you know, I come back to, yeah, this was because my stress levels here on a day-to-day -day basis are so much less than they would be in yeah. some place like Los Angeles or well, Washington, D.C. You well, know, I moved from Boulder, Colorado, which, you know, when I grew up there, it, I mean, grew up hard in Boulder, high school in Westminster, which is, you know, 15 minutes away, and then college in you know, most of my uh, start of my professional career was back in Boulder. Um, kind of a little bit isolated from the big city, but you know, the big thing that made us move here was everything just just started growing. It's just massive amounts of people, and just don't like. I mean, it's just something about going out into the woods on a trail by yourself that kind of makes everything any kind of problem go away and you 
you know, I kind of think I, and I'm sure we, I think we talked about this, you kind of, you're a second set of eyes on problems. You know, you have a problem when you're sitting in, in your normal world, but then when you get out by yourself, out on a trail run, um, you, you look at things differently, totally differently. And you can't do that when there's, you know, a thousand people around, even on the trails. And that's what Boulder became. I mean, the, the Mesa Trail was just non-stop people because they there's just not a whole lot of trails there unlike what people think about boulder it's just there's not a whole lot of places to go to get out and everybody in the whole megalopolis there goes to the front range because you think about denver colorado springs to fort collin is all in the in the great plains they're not in the rockies right they're right on the edge Mm -hmm. and everybody wants to live in this little corridor and be a part of the mountains but they don't want to live in the mountains (laughs) because it's a hard world up there in the winter that's for sure so um, yeah, I think about, God, I, I could be making, you know, I could be making many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if I'd have stuck with high corporate America and run the, but you know, I just don't, I don't even think twice about it. And the quality of life, like you said, is far superior. And think about, you know, what you've done with your kids and your, you know, probably your relationship with your, you know, with your wife and your, and you, the rest of your family is so much it's easier in a place like this it, just it because is. it's so like, yeah this is a, it's like I, I prefer raising my kids in a city like this compared yeah. to los angeles i, I can't didn't, compare when i lived in los angeles i knew i didn't want to raise kids in that city I yeah. just knew it <laughs> so ricky you're uh yeah six months into into the town I yeah mean, not even five five full months five full months your story similar but it's equally yeah. different too it's cool so honestly Everything you guys have just said, I would echo, like, and uh, quality of life here is amazing. We moved here in January. My wife is from Signal Mountain, and that was after about a six-month road trip where we were kind of scouting and seeing where best to, to land, kind of also scouting on behalf of my mom who's about to retire, so we're thinking, you know, set up a little family compound somewhere, and we really had our eyes open for everywhere. You know, on, on everywhere. But landing here, it was just immediately apparent what this city's got. And then finding you guys and, and really just glimpsing the scope of the trails here just was phenomenal. Uh, I'm just kind of curious for both of you guys. Going into Chattanooga from the outside, what, what were you most excited about? And you can explain it a little bit on your end, but like after being here for 11 years, I would wonder if, it, like, if there was anything that shifted that you're like, I really like this and I didn't see it coming into the city. And same for you just for six months too. There's a certain freedom here that I haven't seen before. Like in New Jersey, you gotta pay to go on the beach. <laughs> you have to buy a season pass just to go hang out. You gotta hang that pass on your back. Well, they're, they're, they have that in Boulder now. I mean, yeah. you, 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 have to, you have to pay a season park fast, has to park yeah. at anywhere. You can't, you can't go park on an individual day anymore. And that, that, like, pass. that hits me on a core level. And as yeah. soon as I came here, I saw a guy hop out of his car. He was parked, I think probably where your shop is, or somewhere on the North Shore right there. He hopped out of his car and unstrapped his paddleboard and kicked off his sandals and walked down to the river. Yeah. And I was like, I caught, caught off guard that there, he, he could just do that. <laughs> yeah. And then now seeing all these trailheads and all these mountain bike tracks and it's all just open. So that's just blowing my mind. Well, it's a, it is a unique place that we have here. I mean, um, when I first started uh, Wild Trails, I did this thing where how many trailheads we have within 25 minutes of downtown. It's 54 that I think is pretty legit trailheads. Um, if you go out to Chickamauga Battlefield, you could probably argue that that Battlefield Park, I mean, if you look at every little parking lot, I mean, they, you could add five to that one place alone. But I'm thinking about the significant ones where you can park, you know, 15 or, or more cars. And we got 54 trailheads. And... The reason why we have that many trailheads is because of the awesome forefathers that we have, you know, the, the, all the really incredible uh, visionaries that have lived here, you know, several generations ago that, that got in the habit of buying up land and then giving it back to the community. Yeah. I mean, that's where we got uh, Lula Lake and the, and the Lookout Mountain Conservancy and, you know, the Reflection Riding and 
the Enterprise South was a little bit different thing, but easily the federal government could have sold that because it was an old army depot, could have sold it like they do all over the place and, and it could have been developed. But no, the city said, no, we're gonna, we want it to be a park. Stringers Ridge, they had sold it. They were gonna flatten that thing and build condos on it. And the city said, no, you're yeah. not gonna do that. And I, I still have the Save Stringers Ridge <laughs> hat. I mean, it's um, that kind of stuff is so, it's really sad in this country, that is rare. Yeah. That you get a city behind it. And we've got to think about the people that really were the driving force of this. Bob Corker was kind of yeah. instrumental back then of getting the whole public private partnership thing going. And, um, you know, you look at the, you know, the, the, the key, the key leaders back then, they, they had the vision. It's not, it wasn't about greed. It wasn't about, Hey, well, listen, how much money can we make? Which, yeah. Most wealthy people, that's what they think. It's like, well, how can I make more money? Where these guys, I don't know what happened, but they said, how can we make a better city? And the that's just super money cool. Helped too, you know, those, yep. the, uh, Lindhurst and Benwood and, and uh, you know, they pumped, I know, a lot of money into a lot of these land acquisitions, which helped. And again, but that's part of the grand vision. The people who run those foundations or board of directors bought into that idea. Yeah. I don't think it's hard to, I mean, Corker definitely did a lot, but from what I know, the 11 years I've been here, it seemed like there's a lot of, uh, you can spread around that the... Oh, the, there's, the, yeah, there's, the, a, the, there's a whole the bunch of people. Um, yeah, it was a lot of, um, a lot of it connects to the urban uh, uh, planning process that they did in, in years past and people's desire to have more access to the outdoors. I think well, a lot, of, city, a lot of cities are totally throttled by the the council members that they have where they, you know, they just say, no, we, we, we're not going to do that. We want to, you know, their, their motivations are not, you know, necessarily for the, the future of the city. It's what's going to make the city better right this minute where you can't do that in a, in a place like this or a place anywhere. You have to think, you know, even 10 or 15 years out, which is way beyond where most people want to think. So, And it's thinking creatively too, like just outside here, you see two different murals. Painting murals in your downtown space like gives it a vamp that other cities don't, don't, well, you know, cities that don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. It also discourages graffiti and yeah. it's, it's smart. And yeah. it, you're Urban talking arts about also. the planning, the, you know, the river walk would not have happened in during one commissioner's uh, uh, term, right? right yeah, yeah. That's taken 20 years and they're still not finished with it, right? Yeah. They're still trying to connect it to St. Elmo. I mean, yeah. What an amazing resource that is. Yeah. I mean, I, there isn't a week that goes by that I'm not on the river walk at yeah. least yeah. once. It's phenomenal. it's phenomenal. Well, thank you guys. It was, uh, I mean, it, um, the Chattanooga's got a, we got a ways to go I and mean, we're not there yet. I mean, there's no question that that we have the resources and we have the motivation to make this, you know, the most amazing place to live as far as quality of life. Um, but you know, it's, it's people like you, that are going to help make the difference. So thanks for coming here. And, you know, I, I'm sad to say that, you know, the average citizen of this city is, um, out of shape and getting worse every single day because they, they're sedentary. They don't do much. And, um, you know, it's going to be hopefully people like you that, that'll help turn it around because you, you, you move here because of the lifestyle that we have and, and taking advantage of it. And I think we're, I mean, we're, we're going to be in a better place because of you guys. So thanks. Wow. Thanks. Happy Appreciate to be it. Here. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for going. Thanks for seeing. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Oh, we'll be, we're going to do this next week. It's, it's Memorial Day. Yeah. Two weeks. Sorry. Take a week off. <laughs> See <me>. ya. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was cool.